If you've been listening for a while, you know that I am somewhat confused by my people. I live in Miami, and Cubans uh, can go hard right politically in ways that confuse me because I don't understand how you can be a part of the head of the Proud Boys and be a white supremacist while you're being uh, Hispanic. But there's a book here, and it's been written by Paula Ramos, and she's got a number of credentials that aren't. She descends from journalistic royalty, but her father is also, I think, the most famous Hispanic journalist that there is in this country, Jorge Ramos. But she has her own career. She's made documentaries for Vice. She's a contributor on MSNBC and Telemundo. She reports on Latino issues, and she's building her own legacy in Latin media. She's got a book, Defectors, The Rise of the Latino Far Right and What It Means for America. Thank you, Paula, for joining us. You're from Miami, and I found this book an interesting read for a number of reasons because I really don't understand what is happening with Hispanics. So I hope that you can explain it to me because I don't understand how Hispanics can become white supremacists. I'll try my best. I'll try my best. I grew up in, in Miami, you know, and you mentioned Enrique Tarrio. Um, and so part of what actually drove me to write this book is precisely what you just laid out. You know? How can someone like Enrique Tarrio, who's from Miami, um, who's a black Cuban, you know, an, Afro, an Afro Latino, how could someone like him um, not just be like pro-Trump? You no, know, we, can, we can sort of make the case why someone like him would do that but then take it a step further and become the face and the leader of the Pride Boys. And, and we can talk about sort of my, my first impressions of him whenever you want. Well, I've got a number of different questions, but go ahead and start with him because there seems to be such an overwhelming paranoia here that doesn't even make sense to me. And in your book, which is fantastically reported, you're on the border basically with a Latin person who is delighting in keeping other desperate Latin people out of the country by just spending nine hours in his car tracking and hunting these people who are trying to get to freedom. Absolutely. So you mentioned, so the person you're mentioning, his name is Anthony Agüero, and very much like someone like Enrique Tarrio and a lot of other folks that I've that I've met, I think they're a reflection, an extremist reflection of, of what's happening in this country among a small but growing group of Latinos. No? And that is the fact that increasingly more and more Latinos are warming up to the idea of mass deportations and building a wall. And so how do you make sense of that? Well, I think Trumpism um, is, is really convinced about this idea that a segment of Latinos right now have become so Americanized you know, and so assimilated that they too can sort of buy into the nativism and the anti-immigrant rhetoric. And even if you just look at the numbers, Dan, like what you see is that the Latino community of today is so vastly different from like my father's generation, right? You're looking at Latino community where it is third generation Latinos that are the fastest growing segment among us. You're looking at a community where most of us speak English, where the majority of voters are U.S. born under the age of 50. And so what I found in my reporting is that among that segment, there is a small but growing group of people that even though they feel detached you know, from their immigrant stories, they fear that sort of mainstream America will always see them as these sort of like perpetual foreigners. No? And even if you look at some of the stats, there's sort of some evidence to understand where people's fear is coming from. No? Even if you just look at the anti-Latino hate crimes in this country, they have been steadily rising and they particularly spike when sort of mainstream media is extensively covering things like, you know, there's an invasion at the southern border or the caravans are coming, you know, or these immigrants, son criminales. And so among some people like Enrique Tarrio or the sort of border vigilante that you just mentioned, um, not only do they sort of feel um, the anti-immigrant rhetoric really resonating with them, but they're also driven very aggressively by this push to prove to people like Trump that they too belong in America. And then that turns into forms of extremism. Talk to me about the Proud Boys existing in Miami, and I want to read a passage from your book to the people after you explain to me what Enrique was doing as the head of the Proud Boys and how proud he must have been when Donald Trump is saying out loud in a way that is unfathomable to me, telling the Proud Boys to stand down and stand by. Absolutely. So, so I met Enrique Darrio in 2018. And so I kind of meet him at a time when he starts to kind of like feel himself and feel his power, but he wasn't there just yet. 
So my first impression of Enrique Dario, who, by the way, like grew up just a couple of minutes from where I did, uh, my first impression was that this is a guy um, that is deeply insecure, you know, who sort of can hide who he is behind his sort of like macho, tough appeal. He does it really well. Uh, but he's someone that even according to him, he never really knew where he fit in Miami. You know, in his own words, he was always sort of like too black to be considered a Republican. He felt like he was too independent and too radical to be considered a Democrat. He always said this thing that like no one would ever knock on his door to ask for his vote, even among the sort of Miami Dade Cuban community, which is typically an exile community that looks more like me, you know, light skinned, sort of privileged Latinos. As a black Latino, he never really fit into that. And then come the Proud Boys. You know, and the Proud Boys offer someone like Enrique Tarrio not just this sudden sense of belonging, but power. You no, know? and then you see the way that Enrique, and I saw it like happening in real time, how he suddenly evolves from being this like ordinary, you know, Cubano guy in Miami to then suddenly becoming this guy that is being praised by Donald Trump, praised by Roger Stone, and he takes that power and runs with it. The funny thing, though, the sad thing is that come November 2020, you know, after Enrique Tarrio tries absolutely everything to ensure that Donald Trump wins and he doesn't win, what's fascinating is the way that the Proud Boys, you have this guy called Kyle Chapman, that they instantly try and distance themselves from Enrique Tarrio and from his blackness and his brownness. One of the things that Kyle Chapman says when Enrique is sort of no longer powerful, he says, you know what? The Proud Boys are actually have always been a group that's based on the white race. And he says in the white race alone and any other race has no place in this group. No? And so that sort of shows you how tenuous that sort of idea of white power is. One of the things that my mother has said since I was a child as they came from communism is if you want mm -hmm. to find out about a person's character, give them power. And the reason she used to say it is because when communism came to Cuba, the neighbors who were given the government power to watch the other neighbors all of a sudden became powerful in the ways that you're describing in this book and then abused the power of taking some of their identity that was given to them by the government. So let me read this from... Your interview with Enrique Tario, you say, why define women as housewives? You asked him at one point, why not use another word? And this is something Latin men do all the time. Quote, mm -hmm. because it's like the end goal for us. We're big on family. He said, family is a number one priority for us. He followed up. You need to step up as a man and make sure that you provide for everyone in that household. As a man, that is your job. And then you write... I always got the sense that independent, strong, and outspoken women frightened and intimidated Enrique. I imagine that's why he reserved a special kind of vitriol for them. He would frequently disrupt women's march events with his megaphone. He'd make appearances wearing his signature costume, essentially a full body outfit that resembled a phallus. He would constantly provoke women, including with the use of transphobic slurs. He called Michelle Obama a tranny and refused to apologize despite the uproar that followed. What's happening there? It's just bravado that's wrapped around as armor, the insecurity. That's part of it. But imagine down what it was for me. You know? I'm, I'm a lesbian. I'm a queer woman. I'm a Latina. Um, I, I try and understand the privilege that comes with, with these platforms that I have. And so I understand the power that I have. And I always felt a sense of sort of discomfort that Enrique was feeling among people like me. And people like me are, are everywhere. No, we're just people that like understand that we too can sort of change the dynamic in this country. And there was always something that sort of made him uncomfortable. But Enrique sort of alludes to what I try and, and find in this book. And it's the same conversation that I had with other sort of Latinos in Miami, actually, that also participated in the January 6th insurrection. And that is these, these men that were driven by the anti-immigrant sentiment that we just talked about, um, by this sort of um, fixation with going back to a time when these sort of gender norms, no, and these sort of more patriarchal norms were, were there. Um, they're fixated by that idea. And then what you just mentioned is when I asked them, well, what, what, what was at the heart of what drove you to storm the Capitol that day? One of the main answers was, well, the United States is being taken over by communism. And if someone like Joe Biden won, then that means that this country would turn into communism. And that sort of paranoia, which obviously comes from a real political trauma that a lot of Latinos hold, that just shows you the way that it's been just so injected with mis and disinformation that can truly, truly drive someone to do something as violent as storming the Capitol, no? 
You talked, Paola, in your book about early, about growing up in a Latino bubble. And I'm curious if all this, you know, conversations that we're having, how it sort of impacts the, the sort of Hispanic community today and how much we can sort or how rather we can sort of get some more education and just sort of for people who might still be in that little bubble and get them to sort of see a little bit more of a broader view the way you were explaining these things. Yeah. So just for background, I know, like I I was born in Miami. I grew up in Miami. Um, and when I say that I grew up in a bubble, um, I grew up sort of believing that to be a sort of Latina in Miami, a Cuban American in Miami meant that we all look like me. You no, know, the sort of idea of black humans was black Cubans was always completely erased, not from the conversation. Um, I was someone that even coming out, I felt a lot of shame at the beginning. No, I think because I was just so sort of um, trained to believe that I too had to marry a man, knowing that my Mexican and Cuban family wanted that for me. And so I say this because it took me a while to sort of lean into the person that I am. And I think part of what I try and do in this book is explain, look, um, the way to understand the sort of shift among some Latinos that are finding something appealing in Trumpism actually has so much less to do with Trump and with MAGA and with politics. And it has so much more to do with all of the super uncomfortable conversations that we just like never have as a community. And by that, I mean, like, what does it mean to have a lot of sort of like racial baggage you know, from Latin America? And like, how does that manifest in, in, in the United States? And like, what does colorism mean? How do we even talk about race among Latinos? Like, we kind of don't really know how to talk about that. By that, I also mean like, what does it mean to really think about the weight of colonialism? I know it's like super abstract and super heavy, but like that really impacted our community for centuries and centuries. It's like, what does it mean to also sort of carry that history? And then the last point that I make is, let's also talk about the like political trauma of something like communism, no? Um, communism will always be the sort of antithesis of what it means to be Latino, um, but that also justifies other forms of extremism that we just never catch because we're so used to just sort of hiding under the banner of being anti-communist. Um, so let's also talk about that. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do. How much have you explored or explained that Hispanics generally tend to be Democrats, but Cubans tend to be <laughs> Republican? Look, that's always um, that's always the that's always been the pattern. No, I think the the way that one can explain it is that to be to be a Cuban American, no, to be a Cuban exile, and I saw it with my own family, like that in and of itself, it means that you're so different from other Latinos. Why? Because even our pathway to citizenship is so much easier than it is for any other demographic. No, the way that Cubans have traditionally been welcomed in this country has always been with a lot more open arms than than other Latinos. And so I think that just as a starting point, no, that we can sort of like hide under that protection that America has always given us. Um, I think that explains a lot of things. How did your dad feel about the book? <laughs> um, he... Um, I mean, look, my dad is someone that no matter what I do, he's always like, oh, my God, I'm so proud of you. So I don't I don't know how much, you know, like no matter what, he'll always say that, which I'll take. He's my dad. But no, look, I think what's interesting is that my dad is someone that has been doing this Noticiero Univision for, I don't know, like more than my I'm 36. I mean, he's been doing it for 38 years. And I think his audience has always truly been a Latino community that was really drawn to immigration that, you know, you talk to them in Spanish um, and that community is so vastly different from what it is now. No, I think the assumptions were always that that community was more perhaps progressive, was more democratic leaning, you know, that had more at stake when it comes to immigration. And so I think he's fascinated as I am as well by this idea of like, we have changed so much and we don't even know really how to make sense of that. And who he talks to every day is so different from who I talk to every single day. And I think that's what's like super interesting for us right now. Do you have a plausible make sense explanation for how Hispanics can be against immigration? Um, the, the only explanation I have is that anti-immigrant sentiment and xenophobia, no one's immune to that. No, just because we're sort of descendants of immigrants and just because we're Latinos, that in no way makes us sort of immune to, uh, to also having, like carrying these anti-immigrant sentiments. No, the sort of fear and the, what we're hearing from someone like Donald Trump that every single day tries to create this idea that we're invaded no, that immigrants are bad people, that immigrants are out there eating pets and dogs. Like, 
I understand why people would be scared if that's what you hear every single day. And so I think our job is to sort of ground people in the facts, you know, get people to understand that even statistically, like immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than U.S. born natives. And so I understand where their fear comes, particularly when you have a Republican candidate that uses that megaphone every single day. And why is he doing that, Dan? Well, that's exactly how he won the 2016 election. You no, know, he made build the wall. A, his central message, and that's how he won. In 2020, he toned it down, and now here we are in 2024 where he's trying to make that the centerpiece of his campaign because he knows that it works. What was your initial reaction, immediate visceral reaction to the news that Donald Trump was talking about putting serial numbers on immigrants in something that felt a bit holocausty? It was, I mean, it was that. I'm, it's it's even surreal that we're, like, it is surreal that we're in 2024 and we're literally talking about this. No, and what's even more surreal is the idea that over 50% of Americans could actually fathom, I'm not even talking about being a Republican or a Democrat, but that over 50% of Americans could even fathom bringing this country back to those dark days. No, and so I think part of the problem is that when we're talking about these things and serial numbers and mass deportations and, like, immigrants in this way, like, it's just become this talking point and we hear it on TV, but people have to be grounded in what this means. No? What would it mean to deport over 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country? To, in Donald Trump's own words, like it can turn bloody. And more than anything, Dan, and I think this is important, we're at a point where even Donald Trump doesn't really know where, where he's drawing the line, right? It used to be that he was just targeting undocumented immigrants. And now what we heard after his comments about Haitian migrants Haitian immigrants are legal immigrants right now. They are protected under temporary protected status. And so where is he drawing the line? If you're a legal immigrant, would you also be deported? If you are the sort of U.S. born child of immigrant parents, are you also going to be deported? And so I think that's that's sort of the scary part of all of this. Tony, Billy, you hear the Miami in her accent? That's a lot of Miami. <laughs> I do. Never, yeah. never I, do. Cro- I hear never the croquetica. Goes. I hear the cafecito. No. I hear it all. No. That's my number one stop when I go to the <laughs> Miami. La Canaria, right? Italia, <laughs> see. <laughs> uh, let's close out with something lighter here, even though it's not actually funny, but somehow the way that it was said is universally being laughed at by almost everybody. They're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating... They're eating the pets of the people that live there. I mean, I, that's how, I mean, what, how, I don't even know where to begin. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, like, very good. LOL. Wow. That is it. The name yeah. of the book is Defectors, The Rise of the Latino Far Right and What It Means for America. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for everything you guys do. We have totally lost Amin El Hassan. He is buried in his computer checking out all television theme songs, trying to disprove my theory that Sanford and Son has the best television theme song of all times. He continue, he continues to say it's the Jeffersons. Roy, Roy Wood Jr. is with us. He's got uh, this great television show. It really is. Have I got news for you? It is a, a spinoff on the show that's been done and popular in the UK for 35 years. And it's about the weekly news events with comedians and his group of people is great. And the first two shows have been great. You can check it out on CNN and Max. Uh, But before we get to that and what we're doing with Roy Wood, uh, what is the better television theme song between the Jeffersons and Sanford and Son? Jefferson's is the better of the two, but the best theme song from that era is WKRP in Cincinnati. It's one of the most beautiful, saddest, it is exactly what comedy is. The KRP in Cincinnati theme song is one of the saddest songs. It's a dude writing a letter to a woman he knows he'll never talk to again and letting her know that he's working in a, in a radio station in middle America. Roy, the saddest it's- part about that is the Cincinnati. Not, not, not the I'll never see you again. It's that he has to be. Broke my heart in two, but baby, pay no mind. The price for finding me was losing you. This is not the greatest theme song ever. It's the dichotomy of it in me. Roy, the, the, uh, excuse me, the Jeffersons is listen, aspirational. Listen, listen, let it ride to the first verse. <laughs> He's tired of traveling. <laughs> Never meant to be. Listen at that sad. 
So wait, the show is just a guy working in like a midday part of the station? The theme song is a guy writing a love letter to a woman he'll never be with again. Just if you ever think of me, I'll be here with these miserable turds at the radio station. <laughs> in Cincinnati. Again, I will tell you, Have I Got News For You is great. He's doing a great job with it. And it's on CNN Saturdays at 9 p.m. Eastern. It streams on Max uh, starting each Sunday. Got a lot of things to get to with him. Uh, how did you pick the people that you were working with on this show? Because... Uh, well, I mean, it's it is fun to watch, and you guys have great chemistry. You know, Amber Ruffin and Michael Ian Black are both comedic beasts in their own regard. And you got to remember, bro, this show is a British remake of a show that's still on for thirty five years in England. So the format is tried and true of the panel stuff. So you know, they came to me with some names, but you know, I kind of trusted them a little bit more with who they wanted to put around me because I'm not going to question it. Like these these Hat Trick Productions is essentially the Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells of political satire in England. So you're not going to question the personnel that they put on the roster. So I'm thankful to be a part of it, man. It's just, it's a good ass time. We, we got a lot this week. The hardest part is that the week keeps evolving. We had a, I was in a slack with the writers for the show and we were talking about, oh man, it's, it's crazy. Uh, you know what's going on with the, the VP debate. And then Eric Adams gets indicted. I'm like, well, we can scrap those jokes. Let's get to Eric Adams because i got an assortment of things from pop culture to get to with you, a number of different uh, news items. But what do you think is happening with Eric Adams as the news is now breaking about his indictment? He just made a statement or attempted to make a statement and got heckled at his own uh, press conference just now. I don't know why he did the press conference outdoors. Um, <laughs> I... I, I think it's bribery and like a bunch of you took money from the Turkish government to let Turkish people build cheap buildings in New York or something, allegations or whatever. The, the indictment just got unsealed as we're talking. Um, I will say out of all of the indicted black mayors over the last few decades, he's probably the most charismatic, more charismatic than Ray Nagin. Ray Nagin, Ray Nagin walked so Kwame Kilpatrick could run. <laughs> And now we have Eric Adams, who always looks like he just left the club. <laughs> he does. Uh, you think more charismatic than Marion Barry, huh? Yeah, well, I mean, Marion Barry's the OG of it all. But Marion Barry was a little bit more boisterous. He at least pretended he was for the people. You know, Eric Adams was with Biden last night at the Metropolitan Museum of Art when the indictment news came out. Do you want to be in public when the bad news come out? He might even, and when you're around the president, they jam your phones and stuff. So he probably didn't even know that this was <laughs> happening until he went back outside. That's got to be awkward. What are your thoughts on Diddy? We have made the mistake a couple of times in today's show of showing for some reason <laughs> a, a picture of Eric Adams with Diddy. What do you mean a mistake? You did exactly what you knew. You knew what you was doing. <laughs> you showed that picture. <laughs> um, man, I know that Diddy's lawyer is not doing him any favors making no. all these statements. <laughs> like Diddy's lawyer has just been running his mouth to the media. He's innocent. And then he said today, Diddy plans to testify at his own. If you don't shut your ass up. Are you trying to get the man murdered in jail? <laughs> Costco saying the baby oil is that he likes to buy it in bulk from Costco. That was amazing. You've got to say something. You've got to say some, it's some sort of if it don't fit, you know, if it don't grease, it don't tease. I don't know. He's got to come up with some catchphrase, but don't spitball. This isn't open mic comedy. You can't spitball your, your defense strategy in front of the whole world. If I'm Diddy, I'm praying for Eric Adams in my cell so that I know for sure that the food ain't poison. As a Cubs fan, are you Dagger. thrilled to watch what's happening? Uh, please stop distracting There's me while watching so your television Dude, theme song. Do you remember, believe it or not, I'm walking on it. The greatest Please stop, hero. I'm trying to work it's, here. It's, it was that show great... didn't stand up to the theme song. Hey, look, I'm, not, I'm talking about theme songs here. I'm not talking about the quality of the program, although I did love that show as well. Roy, I told Dan I did not know that shows got canceled until I watched Night Court and they made a joke about Misfits of Science. And I was like, Misfits of Science got canceled? It could happen? Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. I feel like, Dan, honestly, 
with Diddy, we're going to see a reckoning with abuse culture and the power structures within hip hop. And I hope that if nothing else that comes from this, that there can be a complete tear down and evisceration of record labels and the ways that they prey upon young artists as well. Like just all jokes aside, I really hope that we at least get that level of truth. I don't, I hope he doesn't like that there isn't a quick plea in a settlement and they seal up everything. I'm also not saying show the Diddy tapes in court, but there has to be a degree of accountability uh, with all of this. We have to get to Steve Korn Hackey and your semi-sure bet of the week. But as a Cubs fan, are you delighting in what is happening with the White Sox, where unless they win all of their remaining games, they're going to have the worst record in the history of baseball? No one wants that. You don't want that. You don't want to see your friend completely down and out. You want to see them just lose. You don't want to see them turn into the Vanderbilt of baseball, like with respect to Vanderbilt football. Like, I don't. I like it's these are professionals. They, they still take the, and you know, baseball is one of those mental sports where if you think you can't do it, you won't do it. So all of the half those guys are going to get sent down. Um, I don't even know if you can laugh as a Cubs fan because we were supposed to be in the playoffs this year. You so can who really under who you underachieved? Can. You can you can you <laughs> can laugh as a Cubs fan. Let's put this up on the screen here. How do you feel about this marriage per, uh, proposal via Jumbotron? Um, I, I like that. I like that. I, Cause a lot of people feel like you shouldn't propose to a woman at, at, with a losing ass team, but who proposes at games other than diehard fans? Because that is their cathedral, the sports stadium, right? If you are a white Sox fan, you have not known happiness since Tim Anderson got knocked out. You've been down and out and whoever that woman is, Victoria, Vicky or whatever her name was up on the jumbotron. She's been with that man. <laughs> She's been with that man through thick and thin. And now as the White Sox are on the precipice of being the worst of all time, the woke, as they say in the streets, as they're about to become the woke, <laughs> she's still there. You marry that woman. And she knows that you could turn it around immediately. There's, I, I can't remember which team. There's a hundred loss team last year that's in the playoffs this year. And so like that, automatically means that the White Sox have a chance. They're opening up wild card slots left and right. This time next year, there might be eight, there might be nine playoff teams <laughs> in each league. The White Sox could do it. And I think this is the perfect time as a man when you are sad and depressed and you look around and see who's still there and you be with her. Mark Robinson, she should, I'm sorry. She should say no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, before we go to Steve Kornhacki, uh, Mark Robinson is declaring himself on a porn site, uh, Black Nazi, uh, the North Carolina candidate for governor. And J.D. Vance says the allegations are not necessarily reality. Uh, what, uh, what do you see happening here? Um, he's not going to step down. He already said he's not going to. He's lost half of his staff. He said he's coming. He's doing an investigation into who's slandering him. You slandered you. Nobody tell you to go on nude Africa. There's a piece of me though, I mean, vouch for me on this. There's a piece of me that feels like it was kind of a setup by the Democrats on Mark Robinson. Because if you look at the comments he supposedly made on nude Africa, the verbiage doesn't feel black enough. <laughs> it doesn't read like the way a brother would talk, even back in 1998 or whenever he was on this website. In one of the comments, he said the word dookie shoot. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard a single black person say the word dookie shoot. He said grease the dookie shoot. Like, <laughs> I, I've not, just, just tell me, just be honest. Have you ever, Dan, you're, you're <laughs> no. a minority. You've had minority friends no, I've in never the Latino community. No, nobody do you say that. Duke, no. El Duque? <laughs> no. What do you say? And Duke is somebody different and we respect him. <laughs> yes, do not blaspheme oh, yeah. against El Duque. <laughs> uh, El Duque, shoot. Do you, 
no one said no one black says dookie shoot and that's the one thing that gives me one piece of belief that maybe mark robinson is telling the truth that it wasn't him and that he was set up is because somebody said dookie shoot uh we have to get out of here but not before telling everybody that trump is going to be in tuscaloosa on saturday waltz is going to be in ann arbor this leads yeah. us to your semi-sure bet of the week uh, college football and politics merge steve corn is at the board what do you need from him Steve, we got seven swing states. We took seven big schools, and the polling margins um, are pretty, pretty, pretty uh, serious. Now, we compared the polling margins from Nate Silver's model on which candidate is in the front run, and we compared those to game day football victory margins of defeat. So, uh, in North Carolina, we got the Tar Heels. But when Donald Trump is winning by 0.4 percentage points or less in the polls, Carolina is undefeated, winning by an average of 17 points. UNC upset over Duke. Swing state number two, we go into Georgia. Now, when Trump has been within 1.3 percentage points of, the, of his presidential opponent, the Bulldogs win seven in a row. Take it to the bank, Georgia money line over Alabama. Uh, right. Roy, I believe that Steve Hornhacky is confused because I think you're doing his material yeah, now. That's right. He's looking at us okay. like. <laughs> I, th- I think my bad, Steve. <laughs> I'm just going to be breaking down the numbers for you, Roy. But if you want to keep going, I mean, no, you, Steve, you know the numbers you in break advance. It down. <laughs> you All right, break so it down we can break down Steve. the rest of the numbers for you. Obviously, we have Georgia and UNC. UNC over the Dukies. You mentioned uh, that a little bit earlier, but Pennsylvania. We have Pennsylvania here. It's a 1.5 percent percent percentage lead for Kamala Harris. Now, what does that mean for Penn State? Trump has never led in Pennsylvania. However, when he is within 1.5 points in the state, the Penn State Nittany Lions are 3 and 0 with an average margin of 28.3 points. So what does that mean for you, Roy? You tell me. I'm not sure. What <laughs> means we're taking Penn State, Roy. Okay, I like that. I like that. We worked sure on this. <laughs> I'm with it. I'm with it. Keep going. Wisconsin. Keep going. We have Wisconsin here. Harris leads by two, two point two points. Even when Trump is within two point two points, he's never led. But even when he is within two point two points, like right now, the Badgers have never won. They've lost by an average of thirty two <laughs> points per game. So, Roy, what does that mean? USC to cover. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> USC's got to cover. Roy, we asked there you we before go. the segment started, do you know how well, to do this with corn hacky? And you said, I got it covered. No problem. Yeah, I, we're covering it. Let them keep talking. <laughs> The Wildcats. Give me another swing state. The Wildcats Let's go to Arizona. in Arizona. They're two and one when Trump is within 1.5 points in Arizona, but he has not uh, been in that position since October 2016. They've also been down an average of 15 points in those games, despite the fact that they're two and one. So, Roy, who are we taking in Arizona at Utah? I like Utah to cover that spread. Give me Utah over that one. We'll take Utah here. And then finally, this is a big one. Two potential (laughs) swing states. We have Michigan. And according to the real Steve Kornacki, Minnesota back in play. So in Michigan, it's Kamala Harris plus 2.4 in Minnesota. She's up 5.8 percentage points. And when we look at Michigan now, in the last eight years during football season, you have not had Trump leading in Michigan. The Wolverines are 13-2 over that stretch. Only 3-1, though, when Trump is within 2.4 points and an average margin of victory of 11. And when you look at Minnesota, we mentioned that 5.8. Minnesota is 3-2 when Trump is within 5.8. Eight points of the Democratic candidate. They're minus 2.5 in those games. So we do a little bit of math. Michigan plus 11. Minnesota minus 2.5. That means the Golfers minus 8.5. Michigan is a 9.5 point favorite. Roy, in turn, what are we doing here with these numbers? What are we doing? Minnesota is going to cover the spread. That's absolutely right. Give right. me Minnesota. Get out of here, Jeremy. I would like a deeper understanding uh, how the judgment gets made, maybe by a mean. Uh, we've got a professional comedian, and we decided to throw it to Corn Hacky. Like, I, we've got a man who is really funny, and we decided to do more Jeremy. 
<laughs> I work hard. Get out of here, Jeremy. Uh, so we got to recap, Dan. We got to recap, Dan, real quick. To recap, UNC money line, Georgia money line, Penn State to cover 18, USC to cover 16, Utah to cover, and Minnesota back in play. That is the guaranteed semi-sure bet of the week. You're welcome. Have I got news for you? It is a legitimately funny news quiz show that doesn't keep score but pretends to keep score. CNN, Saturdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, streaming on Max starting each Sunday. If you didn't get enough Jeremy now, how about some more next with Pitch Clock? <laughs> Did you like my dookie joke? Or? I can't believe that that went that poorly. Welcome to the Pitch Clock. Here's the pitch, a two-part baseball segment combining a nostalgic baseball trivia game and an interview with an expert. This is the Pitch Clock. Final week of Major League Baseball. We've got some great games going on this week, but first we have to start with a game of our own. Our guest is Mike Schur. He'll be talking 2024 baseball with me in just a moment, but we have Chris Cody in here with me in Yo. Studio B to compete in this game against Mike Taylor. Let us know what's going on in the final game we have of the regular season. You guys can see the papers now. The okay. game today is three strikes and you're out where we'll alternate guesses. Last person standing wins. Getting ready for the postseason. So the list today is of every player that had 20 or more hits in a single postseason Whoa. in the 2000s. So you have the year and the team logo. For the audio audience, in 2000, it's two Yankees. 2002, four Angels and two Giants. 2003, it's three Marlins and two Yankees. 04 is two Red Sox, a Cardinal, a Yankee, and an Astro. And then 2009 is a Yankee. All right, Chris, you're up first. You just Pitch have to clock say the has year. started. Year and player. Uh, I'm going to go with 2004, Albert Pujols. The safest of bets, yes. I will go 2002 Giants, Barry Bonds. That's a strike. What? Wow. All right. Well, this is a <laughs> he got walked too much. He got, a, he got walked yeah, too much. This is a nightmare. I'm embarrassing my family yeah. on this. I don't know why I started this segment <laughs> because I know my dad's watching and he must be so disappointed in me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dad. Mike, sure. Uh, what's your first guess? One of these, one of the Yankees is Jeter, right? Yeah. But I don't know what year Jeter did something there. He had bad postseasons. Yeah, he did. That's what I'm thinking. I'll, I'll, I'll guess. Uh, I'll guess. 2000 Yankees is Jeter. It is Derek Jeter. <sighs> All right. You're up, Chris. I'm like this. You know what? Off. I'm going to play the game. 2003 Yankees, Derek Jeter. 2003 yep. Yankees is Derek Jeter. <laughs> yeah. All right. See, this is what I'm this is what I'm wondering is do we do we go for it in 04 or 05 or 09 rather? I'm All right. 2003 Marlins, Juan Pierre. Juan Pierre is one of them. Okay. A mic is yeah. up right now. I'm going to take, I'm going to make a crazy guess that's probably wrong. But given that game that the Angels came back and beat the Giants in the World Series in, 2000, uh, like in 2002, I'm going to guess that one of the Angels is Scott Spezio. It's not Scott Spezio. Not Scott Spezio. Oh. You know what? <laughs> I have an angel Yo, make me When smile. he started talking yeah. right there, I thought he was going somewhere else. So I'm just going to ride that wave. Uh -huh. As we talk about this 2024 MLB season that's coming to an end this weekend. And Mike, I'll preface with a couple of things here for the listening audience. We record this on Tuesday. So as a mm -hmm. result, we will not be discussing these wild card races in deep detail, but we're mm -hmm. going to make this a Shohei Otani based podcast instead. I hope that's okay. Um, Always. Beca because at the time of this conversation, he has 53 homers and 55 stolen bases. What is your favorite stat of his from this season? And also, is he not just the greatest baseball player of all time, but the greatest athlete who has ever lived? Because <laughs> to me, that's what's going on right now. I don't know that there's an argument against him being the best baseball player who's ever played baseball. But my favorite set of the year is that he had in that in the six for six game, three homers, two doubles, a single, two stolen bases, 17 total bases, the most total bases. In fact, 19, if you count the stolen bases, um, the uh, only 17 total base game without four home runs. But in that game, Otani had 0.7 war in a single game. That is absurd. That is that is a, a, an anomaly, a black swan event. You can't possibly conceive of a game where an individual player 
gains 0.7 war in a single game. However, it is not the highest war he has ever accumulated in a single game because he had a game a couple of years ago where he both threw six and a third innings and struck out 10 guys and gave up two hits. And also, I think was I, I think it was three for three with two homers. And in that game, he got 0.8 war. So Ridiculous. you 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 look at a game where he has arguably the greatest offensive performance ever in history by a single baseball player. And it is not even the most valuable game that he himself has played as a baseball player. And to, to put in perspective that 0.7 war, Jake Berger has 28 home runs this season for the Marlins. He has a 0.5 war. Darren Erdstad. Darren Erdstad, number one on yep. this list. I know, 25 I remember. Wow. Hits. That is one of that is, five. Like, that is, That's is, a safer guess. This is yeah. the prime of me watching baseball. So there's I, a, I remember every game of that 0-2 Angels Giants. There's series. an angel that's coming to mind who I love. is one of my favorite players, but I just don't know if it's possible that he actually had 20 hits. So, hmm. I mean, I'll go 2004 Red Sox. Big Poppy, David Ortiz. David Ortiz is one of the best. Chris, you're in the league. I'm I'm not going to win this. I'm telling you right now because uh, everything is jumbled in my head. But I'm going to stay with the Angels. The other Red Sox is likely Manny, but I'm going to not guess that. I'm going to guess Garrett Anderson. Garrett Anderson is the second eight. Wow. After I just took a victory lap on knowing every game of this series, yeah. this would be bad if I got this wrong, but I'm just going to ride this wave. Tim Salmon. That's not Tim Salmon. Not Tim Salmon. No. Oh. Right. That's a good guess, though. Cocky. So what I've got to decide is do I want to win or do I want to try to just get ones that are interesting? See, this the one that's standing out to me is the, the Astros in 2004. Is the 2004 Houston Astro Carlos Beltran? It is Carlos yes! Beltran. That's that's <laughs> smart. That's a smart guess. All right. That was the that was the that year was he the made year. two two hundred million dollars. Right. I wasn't sure if it was two thousand four. It was two thousand five. <laughs> so I'm feeling really good about that one. Okay. So, Mike, back to you. Uh, I'll guess the other Red Sox in 04 was Manny. It was Manny. Okay. All right. I kind of want to go with my fun Marlins guess, but I'm just too scared. Uh, <laughs> do it, man. All right. Let, Let it fly. Let's Let it this. fly. Let's do this. 2003 Marlins. Juan and That's who I thought you were going to guess. Is it right? It's his... No. Okay. No. He had a great playoff. He did. He was spectacular. I, so there's two other guys. Such a th- dumb guess. I there's guess there's so obviously the other guy. There's kind of three other guys that it could be. I will say I'm going to I'm going to play. You know what? Here's the fun guy that I was thinking of before. 2002 Angels. David Eckstein. David Eckstein had 20 exactly. Yes! Whoa. David Eckstein. Eck. Oh, remember all those hits he had where like it was just a fly ball to left and like a dude fell down and he got a double and everyone's like, he's the MVP. That was wow. ridiculous. I can't believe that. Yankees fans and their reaction on social media uh, has been pretty funny to this Otani 50 50 thing, because I've noticed a lot of them complaining that MLB has not promoted Aaron Judge in the same yeah. way at which they've promoted Shohei Otani. Who has actually had the better offensive season between the two, Shohei Otani or Aaron Judge? It's not surprising they're complaining. Judge's year is absurd. It's He's going to win the MVP, so shut up, first of all. He's going <laughs> to win the MVP. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, there is a, a, an angle you can cock your head at and you could make the argument where you could say that Judge has been more impressive. He did a thing this year, which he has not done in previous years, which is essentially he stopped swinging at anything that wasn't right down the middle. And so basically he has gotten to the point as a hitter where he ignores everything that isn't the perfect pitch for him to hit. And as a result, everything he hits, he's absolutely squaring up. He's barreling. He's destroying the ball. He and Otani both have there. Every time you see, like if you see judge singled in a game, Click on the uh, on the MLB app. Click on the on the hit, and you will see that it has a one hundred and twelve point six mile an hour exit <laughs> yeah, velocity. Exactly. Like everything he hits to wherever it goes, he is absolutely rocketing. Uh, it does help that he's larger than Gronk. He's six seven two eighty five, and he is the strongest. Uh, he's Paul Bunyan, so that helps. But it is phenomenal what he's doing. I I hate I hate admitting this, but the guy is an otherworldly hitter, and I. I don't think you can totally make he's certainly not having a better year, even though he plays the field than Otani and Otani's only hitting. 
because he doesn't play great defense. He plays an important position, but he doesn't play it super well. His base running is not elite. His speed is not elite. He has 10 stolen bases and hasn't been caught, but you could potentially make that argument. I don't think it would hold water because all in all, Otani's offensive skills are more well-rounded and more elite than judges. I'm guessing Knobloch had 20 in one of these years. I'm guessing Bernie did. I'm going to guess the other 2,000... Yankee is Bernie. It's not Bernie. Ah, it's not. Two strikes. Two strikes on Mike Sure. Yeah. Well, the crowd I, I, I'm the going crowd down. I'm not winning gassed. this one. Yeah. When Anyone sure listening does. to this is absolutely shocked. At this point, I've lost track. Chris, two strikes? Chris has I have two, two strikes. Mike has two strikes, and I have one strike. How did this happen? I don't know, but I feel great. I, this is the best. This is the best I've ever felt playing one of these games. Dad, I'm no longer sorry. Uh, this is another random one. I might lose here. Here, I'm just gonna let's do this. Have fun. Giants 0 2. Rich Aurelia. It's not a Rich Aurelia. Yeah. All right, Chris has been eliminated. God, I was so. That's a good guess. I went from winning to losing. Right, let's see if I can keep it going. I'll go 2003 Marlins Luis Castillo. It's not. Luis it's Castillo. not. Damn. All right. I can think of I can think of we're, the others who I think playing, it might be. Name the lineup. From yeah, the Marlins, name the lineup. Right? That's exactly what it is. Because I'm going next <laughs> after that. If Mike gets this one wrong. I is it okay? Uh, there's only one other gonna good hitter in that team, and it's Troy Gloss. So I'm gonna say Troy Gloss. It is Troy damn Gloss. It. Damn it! Oh, damn it! Damn it! Now the pressure's back on. I have four strikes. All right, Troy Gloss. I why can't I think of who the 2002 Giants would have been? There's an obvious. I know. Middle, two, middle two, infielder. Two, yeah, 2000. Uh, that's what I was gonna say. All right, so I'm just gonna stick with it. 2002 Giant Jeff Kent. It's not Jeff. No! Nice. <laughs> you loser. <laughs> you goaded me into for, it. This is for you the win. You confirmed me. Oh, all right, Mike. If you could get one right, you win. If you get it wrong, I'm still alive. I mean, the only 2009 is the only title A Rod had, so I'm going to guess A Rod. It's not A Rod. Yes! Can we, since we're all eliminated, can I just keep playing? I want to play this game. I want to play. Can I play? Everybody has three strikes. We'll, we'll do we sudden all tied. death right now. All right, now. sudden death. There are two teams in baseball in the second half that, to me, have been the best stories. It's my Detroit Tigers, who we've already mentioned, sure. and it's the San Diego Padres. Of those two teams, I give you the Detroit Tigers, I give you the San Diego Padres. Which run has impressed you more? They're, they both come with a little bit of an asterisk to me, right? The Padres are this sleeping giant who accumulated over the last five years an enormous amount of talent. They made a huge number of trades. They stockpiled out. They signed a bunch of free agents. They've spent a billion dollars and they had just underperformed. They let Soto go, which was a really insane thing to do. And people were sort of like, oh, I guess they're waving the white flag on this group of guys. Tatis missed 80 games because of the suspension and various injuries like they've it's just been this kind of cursed franchise. But it seems like what has happened is simply that everything just started clicking the way that I think they thought it would three or four years ago. So it's not like they came out of nowhere. They have, you know, enormously high priced free agents up and down their roster. The Tigers, on the other hand, have no one. The Tigers have no one. They have Tarek Skubal, who's going to win the Cy Young, and he's great. But like name another guy on the Tigers, on your favorite team, the Detroit Tigers. And the, the weird thing about them is they have a couple of super prospecty guys like Spencer yep. Torkelson was like the number two prospect in baseball guys done nothing, right? He's not, he's not good. Like, and, and it's like a weird optical illusion when you look at their team stats, because they don't seem to have anyone who's actually playing that great. And yet here they are controlling their own destiny. And so I think they're the better story. The asterisk though, I will say <laughs> is that this wouldn't be happening without a corresponding collapse by their AL Central brethren, which is very sad because I want the Royals to make the playoffs. I The Twins are always a kind of scrappy underdog team that I root for to make the playoffs, even though inevitably they just meet the Yankees and get swept in the playoffs. But it, the, that's the one thing you can kind of hold against the Tigers is that this would be a very a fun story, not a playoff run, if it hadn't been 
for the collapse of the Twins and the Royals at the exact time that the Tigers were surging. Couldn't agree with you more. It's Parker Meadows coming up and performing. It's Kerry Carpenter, who has the third highest slugging percentage in the league with a minimum of 250 <laughs> at-bats behind Otani and Judge, which doesn't make any sense. Jackson nope. Job gets called up. Ten of their 26 guys on their 26-man roster are rookies. It would be a yeah. really, really cool story. And finally here, Mike, I, I got to end it here. We're at the moment, you know, just several days out from the postseason starting. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Who is your prediction to go to the World Series from each league? And who is your prediction to win the World Series? Look, there's two possibilities. One possibility, which I would love to see, is that Otani keeps doing what he's oh, been doing. Please, and the, and, the, and like carries, carries the Dodgers through and just has, has an David Ortiz 2013-esque playoff run. That would be great. But I think the more likely scenario, just playing the odds, is that it's the Brewers or the Padres or the Mets in the National League and that it's the, I don't know, the Guardians or some wild card team from the AL kind of sneaks in and maybe it's the Tigers. Maybe the Tigers just go on a crazy run. I think that is the more likely scenario than one of the big dogs uh, taken it all. I'll tell you this. If the Tigers make it to the World Series, I will indeed be at a game. That will 100% be Great. happening. 100%. You can join Tigers. Me. Tigers Brewers would I, be a oh, really fun World Series. Ridiculous. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Let's 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 hope for some good baseball. We've got some good baseball coming down the stretch. Several great games going on this weekend, but we have to finish our trivia game now with Chris Cody. Chris, you're up. How's it not Jeff Kent? That's great. Who was good for them? JT Snell. <laughs> it's JT Snell. Yeah, I knew it. He was the only other one I can remember. Oh. I was like, I had it in my brain and it left. I was like, oh. oh. So Chris is back in the sudden death. Jeremy. This is a death. nightmare. Am I going to now come in? This has been a roller coaster of emotions. All right. I'm sticking with my Marlins. 2003 Marlins. Pudge Rodriguez. It is Pudge. Oh, thank God. Did, Whoa. Do we have thank one more God. still there? Did we get all three now? No, there's one no. More there's still one. one more. How have we not guessed their best player? We didn't get Louis. We don't. We don't have the. We don't have the 2009 Yankee still, right? Because no. I guessed A Rod, and that wasn't it. No, we don't have the 2000 Yankee, another 2003 Yankee, a 2004 Yankee, and a 2009 right, uh, Yankee. I I I think 2009 yeah. is Jeter. 2009 is Derek Jeter. Oh my yeah. God! All right, so then I feel like. All right, Chris, you're a pretty up. good player. I mean, I'm just going to let's go for all of it. 04, Jeter. 04 is not Jeter. Yes! <laughs> yes! Oh, spectacular. Okay. All right. Oh, my out? How's this work? Yeah, you're, you're out. out. I mean, you've been out. But, but I was back in, though. <laughs> yeah, we're so all death. out. Everybody's out. This Everybody's is just out. For, this, this is, is just okay. fun. 2,000 two Yankee Chuck Knobloch. Steer not Chuck Knobloch. Yeah, I think he guessed that. <laughs> So now each of us have been eliminated. Mike, you can get eliminated one more time. Or win. Or win, I guess. What's your guess? <laughs> did, I, did we guess? Did we, uh, Paul O'Neill. 2000, Paul O'Neill. It's not Paul. Did we guess that? All right. I think this, Nobody is, wins. this is turning into a soccer draw This right now. is a disaster. Ruben Sierra. <laughs> Ruben Sierra, 03. Yankees. I'll run through, ah, run through it. 2000. Tino Martinez. The uh, most Tino hits Martinez. in a Yankee playoff. The 2002 giant. Kenny Lofton. What? What? Whoa. I didn't even think of him being That's on the crazy. Giants in 2002. I did not either. He was on the Giants that went to the World Series? 03 clearly is Miguel Cabrera. We just didn't say it. Nope. Mr. Marlon, Jeff Conan. Yeah. Oh, God. And then he Bernie was Williams great. was the Yankee. Yeah. Oh, okay. 2004, the last person that you guys missed, it was Hideki Matsui this year. Wow. In 2004. Well, I had the right guy in the wrong year. Yeah. That's amazing. What? A, this was a good great game. game. Good really game, good Taylor. game, Taylor. Well done. That prepares us for the postseason, and we'll have more pitch clock coming up this postseason, so can't wait for it. Mike, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Baseball has indeed been wildly interesting and is about to get a lot more interesting. We had a triple play to clinch a playoff berth in a Padres game. And Jeremy is dying to talk baseball. He's got an assortment of stats he wants to blow in your face. But the yep. problem uh, that has arisen here is that we have lost 
Amin El Hassan since we did that television theme song <laughs> segment. He's been on his computer throughout the Roy Wood interview. Like he turned off his microphone and throughout it, I could hear television theme songs. Play. Simon and Simon was playing. Uh, there, the night uh, night rider. The oh, oh, night rider. Night rider. Uh, he, 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 the A team was playing. He was doing a whole. He, in fact, do it again here, real quick, if you don't mind. The Magnum P. He did a play-by-play -play for me of the Magnum P.I. theme song that came with video, and he said he had the very strong urge, which doesn't come over him musically with any other thing, to get on a helicopter with a gun. He yes. said, like, the, the music produced uh, the feeling in him, like, I want to just fly past some mountains in a helicopter. Dude, I'm telling you, like, I just pulled it up. You know, I said it early in the show. Magnum P.I., one of the great, a better instrumental than Hawaii Five-0. And then I, I pulled it up to prove to Dan, and it was the video. And I started watching, and I was like, you know what? To hell with the song. How about this intro? You got a helicopter. It's diving almost down to water level. It's going past. Now we're over the coast. It says Magna P.I. Now he's in a sports car. Now he's loading a gun. Now he's walking through a jungle with a gun. He's dressed like an admiral or a captain or something. A car blows up. He's on the phone. There it is. Now he's driving the car again with the drop top down. It skirts off into the distance. Now his assistant is doing like sit-ups and tai chi and stuff just to let us know there are other people on this show. But no, it's all about Magna behind that iconic Detroit Tigers hat. The first time I ever saw the Detroit Tigers Let's hat. Let's go Tigers. Was from Magnum PI. <laughs> And I was like, this is a cool hat. That is the dude from the meme where he dusts his hands off. You guys know that guy, Roger E. Mosley. He's there. He's looking at a bottle as he's on the phone. Now we're back to Magnum P.I. He's driving. There's a bull. He's dressed as a robot, and yet nobody dies. The other great part about the A-Team was there was a backstory. <laughs> they let you know what their backstory was. This is a crack commando unit that was framed for a crime they didn't commit. So what do they do? They retreat to the, under, the underground of the Los Angeles and they became soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem and no one can help you, maybe one day landscape known the man, and they shot it right at, you know, it's either at, right at dusk where the sun has dipped below the, the horizon, but it's still light, or it's right at dawn, right before the sun breaks. And as he's driving across this thing, we hear, you know what? I think if you go on Peacock, because this was an NBC show, Knight Rider, all the episodes are there. I might go back and binge it. You know what? As soon as we're done with it, I might leave right now. I'll do some of that with Miami Vice. Now, by the way, uh, we just press skip intro. No way. Sad. All of the enthusiasm that Amin just showed. Uh, and he, he, by the way, I need to say this part. When he was doing the play-by-play -play on Magnum P.I., there was so much in there that you didn't even hear him say at any one point, hey, and now Selex Butler is firing a cannon because yeah. the guy was just yeah. he was just firing a cannon <laughs> in the middle of everything he was doing. He was firing a cannon. The other thing that Amin said that is absolutely true, and my brother and I would roar with laughter at this, he is saying the truth when he says, even though the N-word was allowed on All in the Family, mm -hmm. The A-Team was considered very violent for television, but not so violent that every time there was a giant explosion and you'd see somebody uh, just go clearly flying from a giant explosion, that person would then be seen getting up groggy because yep. they didn't want to show any death on the screen. So they, they would always, death. they would always, there would never be a hurt. No one, no one, <laughs> they, they were just kind of woozy. There would be, you know, somebody would run dead into a gas truck where it would then explode. And then Mr. T would just wander off into the bushes, totally okay, but just a little groggy from what had happened. A little out of breath too. You'd be a little out of breath. That would indicate something bad had happened. A little sweaty, a little out of breath. <laughs> that shows a like they, someone would come up with a machine gun and go, <laughs> and then everybody would be okay. Like, all right, I'm all right, okay. Yes, yeah, just breathless. Just yeah, the, the worst breath. thing. The worst thing that ever happened to anybody is that they were a little winded <sighs> because man, that was hard and dramatic. The fact that 17 things just blew up in our face. Uh, Jeremy, give us the stats that you wanted to get to. All right. I know you wanted to get to these stats, and and Amin will uh, try to distract you with an assortment of theme songs from the computer that he has in front of him. I mean, so we just came out of the pitch clock, but these are all things that we couldn't get to in the pitch clock, including the fact that Jose Ramirez, it's all going to be 
distracted by the fact that Shohei Otani had a 50-50 season. 50-55. And you're, you're yeah, I mean, potentially going to get to 60-60. He's playing in He's Colorado so this great. weekend. great. Jose it's Ramirez crazy. is so great. Jose Ramirez is about to become the seventh player, potentially, to reach 40-40 in a season. He has 38 homers, 38 doubles, and 40 stolen bases. This will be the third season ever where that happens. The other two were Alfonso Soriano. You no. guys might think it's ridiculous to have a TV show about a trucker and his pet chimpanzee. But boy, let me tell you something about BJ and the bear. Ellie De La Cruz, 25 homers, 65 stolen bases. 25 homers, 65 stolen bases. He's the fifth player ever. Ronald Acuna Jr. last year. Joe Morgan, Eric Davis, and Tony's boy, Ricky Henderson, twice. The intro is Thank just you. them riding in the truck, having a good old time. The chimp is pulling the, the horn, and it's, that's, that's the show. BJ and the Bear, and they solve crimes together. <laughs> Bobby Witt went 30-30 this season as a shortstop. Willie Adamas, 30-20 as a shortstop. Jazz Chisholm Jr., everybody kind of forgot about him. He's in New York. 23 homers, 38 stolen bases, playing two different new positions this season. It's crazy what's happening with these guys. Have you ever wanted to go to a performing arts high school in New York City in the 70s and 80s? No? All right. Let me introduce you to the intro to fame. I'm going to live forever. How could you not? I wanted to sing and dance after watching that. Jaron Duran is going to lead the league in both doubles and triples. He'll be the first player to do so since Stan Musial in 1946. For the longest time, in order to make fun of someone who was doing something a little too futuristic, we used to call him Buck Rogers. You know why? Because there's a show called Buck Rogers. <laughs> in the 25th century, and that, ladies and gentlemen, was the future for us. Don't talk to me about Back to the Future or Star Wars or any other stuff. It was Buck Rogers, and many of the uh, technology that we see today came from Buck Rogers. True story. I've talked a lot about the other teams in the AL Central, like the Tigers, like the Royals, but the Guardians are the ones who won it, and it's in large part because of their bullpen. Emmanuel Class A, whose stats are right around Mariano Rivera for his first four seasons in the league. This season, he's becoming the fifth pitcher ever to have an ERA under .75 with at least 50 innings pitched. He's been elite. So here's the deal. You have yourself two guys. One's black and one's white. And they're cops in Miami. And they've got to solve crimes, but they've got to look good while they do it because it's, it's Miami. Like it's not, not slobs like they do in New York, NYPD or whatever. This is the elite of the elite. Miami Vice Mike Ryan's Mariners, they're anchored by Julio Rodriguez, who's been one of the hottest hitters in Major League Baseball in the second half. He went 20-20 this year, which doesn't sound all that impressive, but he's only the second player ever to do so in each of his first three seasons in Major League Baseball, alongside another guy I mentioned, Bobby Wood Jr. As a child, my father would watch Night Court with me. We'd like, gather around, a new episode of Night Court is out. And I thought it was great. And then I rewatched it recently, and it's nothing but hookers and drug addicts and, and this DA who's clearly trying to smash everybody who walked through the door. I don't know how my dad let me watch it, but it was a banger of a show. Shout out to Harry T. Stone presiding. So, hold on. Night Court was just court at night? Yes. Yes, because in New York City, like... You know, you get arrested <laughs> it was on a too full during the day, so they had to go at exactly. Night. There was yeah. so much crime in order to process it all. They had to go to night court, so they went in, and it was always the same judge, Harry T. Stone, played by Harry, the late Harry Anderson, and then the DA was John Larroquette. He played this guy named Dan, and he was lecherous. Let me tell you something: he was trying to have sex. All the time. Court during the day, court during the night. Sounds sort of like a switch hitter in baseball. Anthony Stanton Dare, he has 44 home runs this season as a switch hitter. That's the most behind Chipper Jones, Lance Berkman, and Mickey Mantle twice. I'm so glad you mentioned Chipper Jones because I think of the California Highway uh, Police, Chips, when I hear Chipper Jones. And that was, again, they just saw crimes on motorcycles. Eric Estrada, who, by the way, they made him Italian in the show. Why? I don't know. What? He's so clearly Mexican. You're in California. Just let him be Mexican. Can you find the Chips theme song on your computer here uh, very quickly? I and can. Chris Cody, the other room was offering us an assortment of bad suggestions back there because for some reason everybody wants to talk television theme songs. A lot of people were nominating Friends, which oh. I find objectionable uh, with everything we're talking about. And this is also, a, this isn't a song for the show. This is a song that was already a song before the show. I have to, you have to acknowledge the clap, though. 
while I'll admit this is not an iconic theme song, that part where it's like, that goes on the Mount Rushmore of theme song moments. I've seen the, the Friends theme song mocked more than anything. People always like to recreate the fountain scene because they're so dumb. More than I've heard people say, oh, I love that song. Well, you mentioned Magnum P.I. and Tom Selleck with mm -hmm. his mustache. Another guy with a mustache, Paul Skeens. He has an iconic one himself. You know, he made 22 starts as a rookie, and his ERA was 1.99 as a rookie in 22 starts. It's the second best ever for a rookie behind Steve Rogers. Uh, play the Chips theme song, Chris. Close us out with the Chips theme song. But wait, I have more. Yeah. Let that be. <laughs> yeah. So it's just about motorcycle cops? Yeah. That's, right. yes. That's uh, all you again, needed. Again, a, Tony. A, a motorcycle cop who was Hispanic but wasn't playing a Hispanic. They made him Italian because they thought <laughs> that was too risque to have a Hispanic police officer. So we don't want to hear about Aaron Judge then? Uh, no. Hey, everybody. It's Mike Ryan, and I want to tell you about two of my favorite things, football and Miller Lite. And when you combine the two... That makes for one heck of a Miller times. See, Miller Lite has great taste, but is also less filling. And football, well, it's just spectacular from start to finish. You put those two things together, you've already carved out a perfect day. Miller Lite keeps things simple with undebatable quality, great taste, and only 96 calories. It's a beer that strips away everything that you don't need and holds on to what matters most. A light beer that actually tastes like beer. Make your game time taste like Miller time. Tastes great and is less filling. Let it be both. To get Miller Lite delivered right to your door, visit MillerLite.com slash Dan. Or you can find it pretty much anywhere that sells beer. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories per 12 ounces. Fewer cows and carbs than premium regular beer.